The Son of Man by Benjamin Krems Master. A Master Speaks, Volume 1, page 53. Many people await the return of the Christ with trepidation and fear. They sense that his appearance will promote great changes in all departments of life. His values, they rightly assume, will necessarily alter their ways of thinking and living, and they blanch at such a prospect. Besides, so mystical has been the view of the Christ presented down the centuries by the churches that many fear his judgment and omnipotent power. They await him as God, come to punish the wicked and reward the faithful. It is sadly to be regretted that such a distorted vision of the Christ should so have permeated human consciousness. No such being exists. In order to understand the true nature of the Christ, it is necessary to see him as one among equal sons of God, each endowed with full divine potential, differing only in the degree of manifestation of that divinity. That he has achieved the fullness of that divinity is his glory, and well may we stand in reverence at this achievement. That this same achievement is rare indeed is also indisputably true. But the wonder of the Christ for men is that he was one of them. Not there is in the trials and sufferings of men, but he did know it. Each step of the path that men still tread has he painfully trodden. Nothing is there in the whole panorama of human experience that he has not shared. Thus truly is he the Son of Man. There can be little doubt that were he to appear unannounced in our midst, few would recognize him. So far from the general notion is he that he would pass unnoticed in the crowd. Thus it is today among his brothers, as he awaits man's invitation to begin his mission. Many who see him daily know him not. Others recognize him, but are afraid to speak. Still others wait and pray, hopeful that he may be the one for whom they dare not hope. Only his declaration before the world will establish him in the sight and hearts of men. While we await that day of days, let us clarify in our minds the reason for his return. Let us understand the nature of the task which he has set himself to establish in our midst the fact of God, has he come? To recreate the divine mysteries, is he here? To teach men how to love and love again, is he among us? To establish man's brotherhood, does he walk the earth once more? To keep faith with the Father and with man, does he accept this burden? To usher in the new age, has he returned? to consolidate the treasures of the past, to inspire the marvels of the future, to glorify God and man as he descended from his high mountain. Let us look at his priorities, the establishment of peace, the inauguration of the system of sharing, the removal of guilt and fear, the cleansing of the hearts and minds of men, the education of mankind and the laws of life and love an introduction to the mysteries, the beautification of our cities, the removal of barriers to travel and interchange of peoples, the creation of a pool of knowledge accessible to all. That such a task is not an easy one, not even for the Son of Man, is clear. Ancient habits of division and separation have strong roots, while fear and superstition cast their spell over millions of mankind. But never before in the history of the world has a teacher come better equipped for his task. Maitreya has come to do battle with ignorance and fear, division and want. His weapons are spiritual understanding, knowledge and love. His shining armor is truth itself.